One of the things to consider as a self-defender is when you would pull a gun to defend yourself and point it at someone. Welcome to today's active self-protection lesson. I'm your host, John Correa. Today's video comes to us out of Wenatchee, Washington in the United States. Whether in dry fire or in live fire, the Mantis X Firearms training system really helps you to get better every day with your defensive shooting. I use mine all the time. As we begin, you can see this guy is trying to pay for his alcohol purchase with his ID. He doesn't have any cash on him. What the news story says is he's drunk already, so then he's grabbing all his stuff and says, oh, I'm just going to pay with my ID. And this clerk says, no, I'm not giving you this six-pack of beer, which he rips one of the six-pack out with that. And now he's getting belligerent with her. So she's like, look, man, I'm going to call the cops on you. So you see him throw the little bit of the bag at her and, and wagging his finger at her here. And she's like, okay, well, I think I'm going to take video of this now. So he starts throwing things at her and trying to grab at her. Now he throws the beer bottle at her and hits her in the head with it, which is very serious, obviously. Then turns around, decides he's coming back behind the counter. Now she's trying to fend him off while she's calling the cops, but he's basically not having it. Grabs a hold of her here by the hair and starts dragging her towards the front part of the store. And he can't get her out of the store here in that minute, but he's going to use that as an opportunity to punch her in the back of the head several times, hit her with the uh, another bottle that he has there, punch her some more, and she's just having to fend off significant blows here. Now he's going to go back to the other side of the store back behind the counter here and grab that bottle that he's hit her with earlier and hit her over the head with it again when she is going to run out of the store into the parking lot here. Now he's going to gather up a couple things. Now what we're going to see is it moves in just a second as she's run out there and there is a man with two kids in his truck that is uh, actually pulling a jet ski here. And as she runs out, she yells, leave me alone, help me, help me, somebody help me. This guy's taking some swings at her. Now the guy's going to start to get out of his truck to come and help when our, our uh, assaulter here is going to come over to his car. And when he does, our good guy goes back into the truck, into his console, and draws a firearm. He's a CPL holder in Washington, draws a firearm on the guy, and that cools the guy off pretty good. Now, our, our defender here is now going to tell him to get on the ground. When he doesn't, he's going to long arm him to the ground here and try to get him down, start you know giving other people some commands to try to get this guy into custody and to keep him down until the cops show up. Now, the clerk's going to run off to try, I think, to keep calling the police. And now our good guy here has got a gun in his right hand and is trying to control him with his left. And when our perp gets up, he's going to give him the right knee of fellowship there. And that's going to take the starch right out of that guy's jeans. He's going to hold him down for the next three minutes. I've sped it up just for the sake of time. Holds him there for three minutes, in which time there is a 911 call that there's a man with a gun holding someone at gunpoint. So the cops show up and first officer you can see shows up with a carbine. Thankfully, one of the bystanders you can see has actually grabbed the good guy's pistol and gotten it out of the way at that last second. So the officer isn't worried about that and they are going to take this guy into custody he is being charged with robbery and with assault a couple other things clerk was not badly injured according to the news story and our good guy does not face any charges his actions were deemed to be justified in the moment let's talk about it i'm sure glad that he was there in that moment to help protect that woman if you want to get better at your self-defense one of the ways that you can do that is by joining us at the active self-protection national conference to benefit the Flint Hills Foster Teen Camp. I would also like to say a great thank you to the Nanook Protective Cases for being one of the sponsors of the National Conference and doing good for foster kids. Link in the description with more on how you can be a part. Out of today's video, I wanna think about being in a vulnerable population, about the importance of empty-handed skills, and about using a gun in order to control someone. There is literally so much to think about out of this one. First one about pre-attack indicators, that this guy is going to show himself to be violent pretty early. And when you're a vulnerable population, particularly here we have a woman who is, women are in vulnerable populations. Men do by and large think that they can overwhelm people and, and that women make a more enticing target because they are less likely to have upper body strength, less likely to be able to fight. So men think that they can physically overpower, which is generally speaking true. So recognize here that he has already shown physical violence by trying to rip something out of her hands. He's trying to steal from her and now using physical intimidation to do so. So this is a pretty significant issue. Recognizing that these pre-attack indicators happen, once somebody's willing to do violence in one way, they're very likely to be able and willing to escalate that violence. So particularly if you're in a vulnerable population, pay attention to those cues so that you can take steps to make yourself safer. Now, of course, she's like, no, man, I'm not going to let you steal that stuff. And I do want to say he's starting to throw things at her here and him being willing to throw things at her and here in a little while, while 
you know, uh, uh, you know, paw at her and those kind of things. Those are the cues that you've got to absolutely take seriously and recognize that if you don't have your attitude, your skills, and your plan ready ahead of time, now you're asking the question, oh no, what do I do? This guy can get violent, which is why I say to train ahead of time, to get yourself ready emotionally, mentally, and physically to be able to defend yourself that you can say, oh no, I'm going to implement my plan at this point and not think what the heck am I going to do at this point. Now, certainly, you know, you can ask the question, at what point could she have done something? Well, certainly as he's going to come over here and throw the bottle cap at her, that is clearly an indicator that he is violent. Now, I'm not saying that if she would have had a firearm on her, that it would have been wise to draw a firearm at this point or the right thing to do. But certainly if she had a less lethal tool like a pepper spray, this guy has physically assaulted her a couple times. She could absolutely have blessed him with the hot sauce at that point and been totally justified and probably would have cooled him off. Which is one of the reasons I say a pepper spray can be a very useful tool and that's why I carry one and recommend people do as well. Now right there, of course, the beer bottle, that's aggravated assault in my opinion. He's assaulting her with a weapon that can cause great bodily injury and therefore that's a big problem. Now, she's trying to get on the phone here with 911, but notice now the fight's on and you gotta recognize when the time is that, hey, I'm gonna try to get the cavalry here, but understand the police will never get there in time to protect you. You are the primary agent in your own rescue and therefore this is the time here for a robust empty-handed skill. Skill set. And yes, I strongly recommend that all women have a robust empty handed skill set because especially if you don't have size, you don't have strength, you need technique. So having that, that significant skill set to be able to drop the phone and get after it with this guy in the moment is important. And I think part of that here is notice he's got a hold of her by the hair and he's dragging her. And I don't see a whole lot of martial arts that deal with somebody being dragged by the hair in anything resembling a realistic manner. You can get that, but what you got to do is you got to get on the mat with trusted people and work through these problems. And this is where grappling and, and standing and ground skills come into play. And I do think these are important for CCW to have. And I do think these are important for all women to have because those kinds of skills are what comes into play in real life. These kinds of grappling problems, these kinds of close quarters problems are very common. So learning to solve those problems is an important part of your empty handed skill set. I do think she has pretty good emotional fitness here. Of course, she is taking a pretty significant beating from this guy, took another hit on the head from a bottle and, and she's keeping her hands up. That's great. But more than anything, an emotional fitness to stay present. Now, at this point, I would strongly recommend she has the ability to get out of the danger zone. Takes her a while to get up, though. So she's going to take some more problems, but she does a great job of getting out of the danger zone as quickly as she can. And if you can get out of the danger zone, that's the thing to do to hopefully go get some help and to get somebody else involved to hopefully overwhelm this guy with numbers. Really good and really useful here. Now, let's think about the guy in the truck and getting involved in third party encounters first and foremost. You must come up with your ethic of getting involved in third party encounters now. Do not wait until that moment of thinking, gosh, should I get involved? Now, what might, might uh, change your mind either way? This man has two children in the car. You might say, listen, if I'm by myself, I'm totally willing to step into third party encounters. But if I have my children, my responsibility is to them first and foremost. And so I'm probably not gonna get involved in any third party encounters because I want my children to be kept safe first and foremost. And that's a perfectly acceptable ethic. You may say instead, nope, nobody else's problems are mine. It's not my circus and not my monkeys. That's your choice as well. Or you can say, I'm gonna get involved regardless. That's okay, but find your ethic and set those lines right now. Now, notice he is going to get out of the car here first in response to this uh, you know, this assault. And I think that's really wise. But when the guy comes over now, again, the news story says our good guy goes to the truck and gets his firearm out. Now let's talk about using a firearm as a, a tool to force compliance. Now, if you go to the state of Washington statutes and you look up their defensive display statute, the state of Washington is actually pretty good with their defensive display statute. They, they have a, a statute on the books that says that you can uh, defensively display a firearm to uh, ward off an imminent or immediate threat of physical harm. And so that's what this guy did here. And that's totally fine in his jurisdiction in the state of Arizona, where I am probably would be totally fine as well. We have a similar statute. But I do want you to be aware that every state is different here. And in some states, every jurisdiction within the state might be different on this. In some states, you cannot draw a firearm unless it's an imminent threat of, of deadly force, not just physical force. In some states, even then, you can't draw it unless you're willing to use it, unless it's actually justified to use the firearm. So I can't tell you enough. Number one, get to a legal use of force class in your state so that you know when in your state you can draw a firearm. And if you're going to visit another state, learn those states' laws as well. And make sure that you follow those rules because they can be different. Here it was no problem because of the state statute in the state of Washington. 
but I want to just be very aware of these things. All right, a couple other bits on this. He's got his gun out from the console of his truck, and now he has to, to get after this guy and start issuing him commands. This is one of the reasons I actually really recommend keeping the gun on your person, keeping a holster on your person, because he's going to have to control this guy, and he's going to close with him, but he's got to issue commands in this instance with that gun. There is a time to get that gun out and on target and start issuing commands with it. Also a time to use a low ready, and you're going to have to, at some point, put that gun back away in the holster. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. But just because you draw the firearm doesn't mean necessarily that you have to use the firearm and the drawing of the firearm may not be considered lethal force depending on your state's jurisdictional laws. Now, let's see what our good guy does here. Notice here that he goes for a long arm. He grabs a hold of the guy with his left hand, grabs the, the perp's left hand, and then puts his forearm in the bicep of the bad guy. Now, that, that said, or tricep rather. That said, notice he's pointing a gun all around. This is why I say you wanna have a holster on your person because if I have to go hands on with somebody, I wanna put that gun away in the holster where it's gonna stay secure and allow me to use both my hands and not point a firearm all over the place in the process of controlling somebody. So this is why even in the car, leave the gun in the holster and leave the holster on your person. So then that way, if you know things change and it's not a lethal threat anymore and you need to use both hands in physical defense, you can do that without jeopardizing your firearm, putting it where the bad guy can get it, and you have both hands available to you. That's incredibly important. Now then, he's gotta control this guy, and this is an important part of empty-handed skills. And another reason I say, put the gun away in the holster and keep that holster on your person because both hands are necessary here. Now our good guy's gonna improvise and gonna give this guy the right knee of fellowship, and that's fantastic and worked out well for him. Okay, but recognize the 911 call came in here as man with a gun pointing a gun at somebody in the parking lot. You may not be first on scene because you've got to recognize what else is going on, but you don't want that cop showing up and seeing you with a gun in hand if you can help it. So again, get a holster. Now, why would this officer show up with his patrol rifle? Because the call that they got was man with a gun holding a gun on somebody in a parking lot. That doesn't necessarily sound like good guy holding bad guy. So the officer shows up heavy and I don't blame him for that one iota. So the better thing here for him to do, the officer did a fine job of all that stuff. Now, thankfully that the other bystander in black there has grabbed a hold of the gun at that point and the guy has taken it off him. Okay, fine. He's allowed him to do that because the officer's coming up. So our good guy has put that gun aside. The bystander has. But that's dangerous all the way around because now I'm handing a gun to somebody that I don't know, trusting that he's not going to do anything stupid with a gun in his hand and get shot by the responding officer. So far better, guys. Put the gun in hand. I think the officer handled this one really cool. He was really good about that. Didn't flip out over the guy with a gun in his hand. But this could have gone very, very badly. So make sure, A, that you try to your best to win the fight to the phones, right? Get to the 911 call first so that it's not a, a panic call about a man with a gun or get somebody else to do that for you. That's great. Even using your smartphone or whatever in your voice commands in order to get on the phone with 911 is definitely the way to do it. Secondly, let's make sure we have that holster on our person so that when responding officers show up, we don't have a gun in our hand, we don't get shot ourselves, and let's make sure that we have the attitude and the skills and the plan that we need to have something like this as we cover our ASP.